I absolutely love growing plants on moss poles. They help me get the best out of my plants and optimize the vertical space. But not all plants need a moss pole or can actually take advantage of them. And in today's video, I'm gonna show you 10 plants that I have decided to not grow on moss poles and I'll explain why. Hey everybody and welcome back to my YouTube channel. Now before I go into the 10 plants that I want to show you today, let's recap why I love using moss poles in the first place because understanding why I love to grow using moss poles will help us understand why I have then chosen to not give some of my plants moss poles. Now I like to grow moss poles for three reasons in particular. The first one is pretty obvious, they are a vertical support. That in itself already gives us the answer what plants can benefit from a moss pole in the first place. Climbing plants. Plants that would normally climb up trees in nature can grow up moss poles and the moss pole is basically mimicking the tree. The second reason I like to use moss poles is because they're not just a vertical support, they're also an extension of the pot. The moss in itself is a growing medium and are water and provide nutrients to the moss in the moss pole so that the plant can actually root into the moss pole and extend its root system. Now that's the fundamental difference between using a moss pole and using uh, let's say like a bamboo stick or a piece of wood for example. The bamboo stick, the piece of wood is not a growing medium so yes that would provide you with a vertical support but it will not be a vertical extension of the pot. While we're on this topic for the sake of today's video I will keep referring back to moss poles but you can also fill your poles with other growing mediums as long as we're sticking to the principle that the medium should be able to retain moisture and nutrients so that the roots can grow into it and actually use it as a growing medium then it's gonna work. So I've also used poles filled with cocoa chips before or aeroid mix or a little bit of moss and cocoa chips and like a mix of all of those. They all have the same principle that we're relying on being a vertical extension of the pot. But if you want to understand more about the differences um, in relation to those, I have a specific video where I compare all vertical supports, which I'll link at the end screen. But for the sake of today's video, let's keep referring to them as just moss poles. And and then the third reason is aesthetic reasons. I use moss poles to help me train my plants to create nice aesthetic displays. If you have a moss pole on one side, the moss pole in itself is automatically going to force all of the leaves to go to the other side. So it helps me create nice display sites. So now that we know the reasons why I like to use moss poles in the first place, let's look at some plants that I have chosen to not grow on moss poles. And as we go through each of them, I'll kind of explain why I made that decision. Let's just start off right next to me because it's here and it's convenient. This is my skin depsis. Now you can grow Scandapsis up on moss poles. However, the main reason why I like to use moss poles is because they enable me to get the plant to maturity without any setbacks. When Scandapsis mature, they don't necessarily increase in leaf size all too much. So for me personally, I have no desire to mature this plant. It's actually a plant that can tolerate very low light conditions and that's exactly what I grow it for. The conditions that the plant is growing in will always set the potential potential for growth. Using a moss pole is just helping us realize that potential by providing water and nutrients, helping the plant establish a larger root system and so on. The moss pole in itself is not going to make the plant mature. Now I don't want this plant to mature in the first place and I don't want this plant to be in a position that really enables it to mature. I got this for the purpose of being a filler plant in a darker corner. So given that I don't want to mature it and that it's not really even getting the conditions that it would enable it to mature in the first place, I feel like there is absolutely no need to provide it with a moss pole. I actually like the shingling look of this plant when growing vertically but the effort of having to keep the moss pole moist and then chop and extends and so on just to kind of perpetuate a small display is not worth it for me. Instead, I much rather have this kind of grow wild without me doing anything. I water this plant maybe, maybe once a month maximum. 
Um, I have not repotted this plant in probably two and a half years by now. Like I'm doing nothing for this plant. It hasn't had any pests, it does nothing. If I would grow this on the moss pile, it would require much more effort for me to look after it and maintain it, but I don't necessarily think I would be rewarded with a nicer display. Um, at least that's my personal preference. Now, if we compare that to a Monstera dubia, for example, Monstera dubia also shingles at the very beginning, but as the plant matures, it can actually grow really, really large. And I personally had a really easy time maturing my Monstera dubia. So for the Monstera dubia, it makes total sense to use a moss pile because as soon as it reaches the top of the moss pile, I don't want to create any setbacks. I want the plant to continuously mature. That's when I can do my chop and extend, where I chop the plant in half, repot it, re-extend the top part of the pole and then the plant can continuously grow and continuously mature facilitated by the root system within the pole. With this one I have no desire to do that so why would I want to grow it on a moss pole in the first place? I hope that makes sense. Anyway, basically in a nutshell I prefer trailing and secondly I'm not worried about a setback in case I would need to chop this back because I'm not aiming for maturity anyway. Let's move on to number two and it's most likely the most popular houseplant in the world, Monstera Deliciosa. Now I don't actually have a normal green version of Monstera Deliciosa, I have this one over here which is the Brazil form apparently. So let's Let's move this around. Let's bring this one a bit closer so we can have a look at it. And I'm determined to do all of this without getting up. <laughs> Actually, I want to take this out of the pot. I haven't taken this out of the pot in ages. Ooh, roots. Oh, and a spider. Look at her. Welcome to Australia. I'm sorry, spider. Um, why don't I just do absolutely nothing and you stay there and um, we get along. And I'll just put this back outside. This plant lives outside. That's why there's a spider in it. Happy days. <laughs> Good reminder for the upcoming spring when I do some gardening. Spider season. I gotta be careful. Anyway, let's talk about Monstera Deliciosa. I personally don't think Monstera Deliciosa really has the need for a moss pole. There's a couple of reasons for that. First of all, Monstera Deliciosa actually grows with quite small internodal spacing. I do believe that this internodal spacing on the Brazil form is actually much larger than the normal internodal spacing on some green versions. We have Monstera Deliciosa growing everywhere over here in Sydney and none of them is on the moss pole. They grow up lampposts, they grow up walls, they grow crawling as well at times. You can grow Deliciosa crawling as well and they're having a really, really easy time maturing. It's almost like Monstera Deliciosa is a weed over here. Like it's taking over. Big Monstera Deliciosa. Seems to be a little sun stressed over here. Look at this. These are just aerial roots. And if we follow them up, oh, you guessed it. More Monsteras. More aerial roots, more Monsteras. Climbing up that tree over there as well. But look at all these aerial roots with the monsteras. More monsteras. More bloody monsteras. Guess what? More monsteras. Monsteras. Have a look at this wall of monstera behind me. Now, to mature a Monstera Deliciosa, and that's most likely what we want, right? We want the big leaves, we want the fenestrations, and, and so on. That's what people are aiming for. To get a Monstera Deliciosa to mature, you first and foremost need to provide this plant with quite a lot of light. Out on the street, they're growing in full sunlight. Of course, the full sunlight sometimes bleaches them a little bit, and actually the ones that are growing like semi-shaded usually do best because more light doesn't always mean bigger leaves. At some stage, the leaves are also gonna get smaller to protect themselves from the harsh sun, right? But basically, to really get these nice mature leaves, you first and foremost need to provide this plant with a lot of light. If you provide the plant with a lot of light, the plant is going to mature fairly fast and it's gonna grow with short internodal spacing. So a Monstera Deliciosa could very easily mature by the time it only grew like maybe this much above the pot, if you provide it with sufficient light. So you don't really need 
a lot of length for a Monstera Deliciosa to mature, right? Like you don't need to grow that on three, four, five poles, go through chop and extends until you finally manage to mature that plant. That doesn't mean that you can't provide your Deliciosa with a support. I have given mine an iron bark support over here. However, the iron bark support comes with some challenges. Yes, it provides the plant with that vertical growth that the plant likes because that's how they grow in nature. But if this plant reaches the top of the pole, I'm in trouble. This plant is actually growing roots into the iron bark and thoroughly attaching it. For me to get this off the iron bark, I basically end up having to rip the roots off. So the goal is to kind of not take this off the iron bark. Hence, I need to choose plants that grow very slowly or gr climb very slowly and with short internodal spacing, so I'm not faced by the issue of it reaching the top very frequently. Let's take it back to the example of my Monstera dubia. If I would have grown my Monstera dubia on an iron bark pole like this one, by the time it reached the top, it would still be juvenile and shingling. Now what? Okay, maybe I can somewhat extend it at least once. Okay, then it keeps growing. By the time it reaches the second pole, it's probably slowly starting to mature a little bit. I might have had like one fenestration. But then what? I can't just continuously extend the pole and the pole. I'm limited by ceiling height and eventually also will get a little bit top heavy. Right? So with my Monstera dubia I rely on the root system within the pole and the chop and extends to enable it to mature without any setbacks. With the Monstera deliciosa I don't really need to chop and extend frequently for this plant to mature. It's going to mature within a much shorter space if that makes sense. Now secondly, even if I would have to at some stage cut this Monstera and propagate it and start it on a fresh pole, with Monstera Deliciosa, and this is probably not the best example because it is a Brazil form and it doesn't climb as neatly as the normal Deliciosa, at least in my opinion. But what they all have in common is that they all have these really chunky, thick aerial roots. Now these are very hardy. They are not gonna dry out anytime soon. If I compare that to the roots a lot of my philodendron throw out, for example, let's take the worst one, philodendron vercoisum. Those roots are super fine and finicky and they're very easily dry out. You will never see a um, philodendron vercoisum root this long without having dried up. It would literally dry up here straight away unless it's provided with a grow medium to grow into. Now because these aerial roots grow really really lengthy and they're easy going and so on, what you can do is you can just take these and put them back into the pot. Once they're in the pot, they'll start growing into proper water roots, building a larger root system for the plant, but also building a root system for that particular node that this aerial root came from. So if I would ever have to chop it up, I could chop it here and this node will already have a root system down here in the pot. Now that doesn't work with a philodendron vercoisum for example. A philodendron vercoisum will never grow a root up here into a pot that's down there. That node up here will only ever grow a root system within the near proximity of that node. The roots would just always dry out before they would reach the medium unless the medium is right next to the node and that's exactly what the moss pole is. So basically couple of reasons why I don't give my Deliciosa a moss pole because they have really good aerial roots that you can redirect into the pot and secondly it matures within a really short amount of space so I'm not relying on chopping extents to facilitate maturity or to not lose maturity over the years. I hope the spider is still there. Still, oh my god the spider is gone. Where's the spider gone? Oh my god that's terrible news. Fuck. Oh no, it's still there. Okay, it's on the inside of the pot now. All right, let me quickly put this back outside, but I'll just quickly show you these roots that I was referring to, and I'll just put this outside without being bitten, ideally. Oh no! I had this whole display planned out so it looks nice for you guys. Like I should have just not looked, right? Oh my God, imagine I wouldn't have looked, but I'll see it later on in the editing. <laughs> Actually, ignorance is bliss. I should have just not looked. Anyway, I'm really not like afraid of spiders. I just, and this one is just a huntsman. This one was actually a baby. This one was tiny. But they can bite and it hurts. It's not poisonous, but it hurts. 
Like, I don't mind them. I'm happy to coexist with them. They just shouldn't touch me. All right, next up, Monstera Thai Constellation. Well, that's not necessarily a surprise because Monstera Thai Constellation is really just a tissue cultured variegated deliciosa. Now, I think this actually um, explains what I tried to explain with the deliciosa earlier a little bit better. You can see this, right? Hopefully. I'm growing mine crawling. So, yes, it can be a climber, but it can also kind of crawl along the forest floor. Um, I've seen Tim from Grow Vertical has a really beautiful one growing up a Grow Vertical pole by a really thick Grow Vertical pole. And seeing his actually did make me contemplate mine, but for now I'm happy to keep it as it is. Now over here you should be able to very clearly see how this plant crawls along the surface of the pot and then it just throws out leaves kind of like a fan left right left right left right but that's the really short internal spacing i'm referring to right now imagine that vertically let me put it down it's heavy oh, it is a slow grower for me and it's only really growing this much um well horizontally right it's only growing this much in like almost three years I believe so if I would have had this on a moss pole which is perfectly fine it would have only climbed this far up the moss pole again uh, there's absolutely no need for chop and extend to keep the maturity so if I don't have to do chop and extends to me personally it's not worth making the moss pole and then constantly keeping the moss pole moist as well if you have a moss pole and it, the plant grows roots into it and you then let it dry out and then you re-moisten it you're running risk of root rot as with any other medium right we're treating the moss pole like a vertical extension of the pot but because of the vertical exposure and because of the larger surface area the moss pole will most likely dry out a bit faster than a pot would so if you give it a moss pole but you then end up not really continuously keeping the moss pole moist you can actually cause more harm than good so if you're not planning on actually keeping that moss pole moist then you're better off not giving your plant one in the first place right like when i give it a moss pole the benefit is that each node makes contact with the moss and then each node can grow a root system into the pole but if i grow it like this as a crawler then every node makes contact with the substrate and every node can grow roots into the substrate so I'm achieving the same just without having to maintain the moss pole as well. There should be a root somewhere there, somewhere there that you can hopefully see very clearly coming from the node going straight into the substrate. That's all I need. I just want every node to grow its own root system. The more roots, the better. Now also get a load of this root over here. It's growing like along the patio. And um, eventually, once it grows a little bit longer, I'm gonna try and fiddle this back into the pot. Easy. To get my tie to mature, I really need to probably work on the conditions. I don't need to work on optimizing the root system for this plant. Because every node is already making contact with the substrate anyway. So I'm already optimizing the root system just by growing it normally. Before we move on to the next plant, let's wrap up this whole Monstera Deliciosa thing. Behind me, you see my variegated Monstera Deliciosa, and yes, I've grown this on a moss pole. I've not grown this on a moss pole to help it mature, because again, maturity would be set by the conditions that it's grown in. I'm not necessarily growing this plant on a moss pole for aesthetic purposes either. The plant really just faces the light anyway, which creates that nice display side. The reason why I'm growing my variegated Monstera Deliciosa on a moss pole is for the propagation benefits. Every single node has grown a root system into the pole, which means that by the time I need to propagate this plant, either because of chop and extends or because I want to pass on some single node cuttings, the likeliness of anything going wrong with my propagation is pretty much zero. Every node has already been air layered as the plant grows up the moss pole. So the variegated version is obviously a little bit more challenged, right? The white part is a mutation and the white part has no chlorophyll, cannot contribute to photosynthesis, but still requires energy for upkeeping. So the plant is challenged compared to its green version, which also means that propagating a variegated plant is more challenging. Keeping a variegated plant alive is more challenging. Getting a variegated plant to mature is more challenging and so on. And because of the challenges, I just figured a moss pole gives me a little more security in my propagation approach. Gives me more security in case there's root rot. Because, well, 
it would need to have root rot not just in the pot but also throughout the entire 180 centimeter moss pile which is quite unlikely. So for my Deliciosa it's definitely a propagation tool, it's an insurance policy, yet it's definitely a vertical extension of the pot and it's also well, a vertical support but for my variegated Monstera I see much more purpose in having a moss pile and in maintaining the moss pile than for the Thai that grows much shorter or a green version. One moment I'll bring it a bit closer. Look at all of the roots that are going into the pole from here. So I'm really optimizing the root system over here. Yes, some roots go around the pole and aren't actually taking advantage of the water within the moss pile, but that's okay. This root, for example, comes from here and I fiddle it all the way back into the pot. So it's still doing what I'm asking it to do, but all of these roots will enable me to very easily propagate this plant. And I have gone through at definitely one, maybe two, I can't remember, at least one or two chop and extents with my variegated Monstera already as well, without seeing any decrease in leaf size, right? So this would have been the leaf before the chop and then this would have been the next leaf after the chop. Maybe teeny tiny bit smaller, but it actually has more fenestration. So that's exactly what I want, right? I don't want massive setbacks when growing a plant. That kind of genetically is already set back. Oh my God, can you tell I'm really passionate about this topic? <laughs> I get so like... <laughs> okay, uh, let's move on. Right, the next one is a real obvious one. And I hope by now the purpose of a moss pile has come through very loud and clear so that it is not a surprise that alocasias do not need a moss pile. If you put a moss pile in a pot with an alocasia, the alocasia is gonna care zero about that moss pile. So you just wasted a lot of time and effort making a moss pile and if you maintain that moss or you constantly keep that moss pile moist as well, you're also wasting a lot of time doing that. Alocasias grow as, uh, oh my god, how do you call that? How do you call it? Like bushy. <laughs> Alocasias basically grow from a rhizome. Just to keep it really simple, they're basically going to grow leaves that come out of the pot. This plant is never going to by itself climb up vertically anywhere, right? It's just not a climber. I honestly get asked probably at least once a week um, whether people should put their alocasias on moss piles. And I believe a lot of the confusion comes from, um, at least on my page, my Philodendron Glorious. Every time I post about my Philodendron Glorious, I get so many comments from people saying, oh, elephant ear, elephant ear, elephant ear, because it's a large leaf, I believe. But I believe that elephant ear is usually a commonly used term for alocasias, colocasias, and so on, right? So I think that's maybe where the confusion comes from. People see my big philodendron glorious on a moss pole and they think it's an alocasia because of the large dark leaves and then they make the assumption that all alocasias should be on moss poles. Couldn't be further from the truth. So I thought it was an obvious one, but just purely based on the questions that I get online, I do th just wanted to say it, right? Um, might as well. On that note, that then also obviously applies to all of the other plants that aren't necessarily known for being climbers, right? Like I wouldn't put a begonia on a moss pole. I wouldn't put a fern on a moss pole. I wouldn't put a cactus on a moss pole and so on, right? Um, I wouldn't put a banana on a moss pole. I wouldn't put a strelitzia on a moss pole. I wouldn't put a peace lily on a moss pole and so on, right? Like you, you kind of see the theme, right? If a plant grows kind of bushy out of its pot, no moss pole. If a plant wants to climb because in nature it would climb up a tree, then you can give it a moss pole, but you don't have to, as seen with my deliciosas. Next up, my Discovia Discolor. Yes, it looks like an empty pot. That's because it is still an empty pot. We are technically still in winter, but it's 29 degrees today. I suppose spring has started a bit early. But yeah, she was dormant all winter long, as she does every year, and I just repotted her, waiting for her to come back. So she is an empty pot, but let me insert some footage from last year's comeback. Now, as you can see, it definitely grows vertically, right? I gave it a veggie trellis, um, like that you, you, know, you would normally use for tomatoes or cucumbers or something like that. 
and the plant is loving it. I have a little time lapse of when some of these shoots first came out. You can really see how they kind of lasso themselves around, they're looking for the trellis and then once they find the trellis they kind of just really like it kind of pounced the trellis a little bit until it's fastened and secured over there. And from there, it takes over the entire trellis within just a couple of weeks. So it's definitely a climber, but this plant does not require an extension of the root system. This plant grows via... Oh my God, am I using the wrong word again? I think this time it's tubers. Basically, little potatoes under the ground. <laughs> so it basically has a little tuber in the ground and that tuber is then going to grow all of the roots and then it's going to give you a shoot. Which means that the vine in itself is not going to grow any roots. So the vine in itself is not going to grow roots into the moss pile. Like maybe technically it could and then it could grow like a new tuber and so on but very very unlikely or at least that's not really what you're after. The moss pile, and if you keep the moss pile moist, I think it would actually cause way more damage than it does good. I think the moisture of the moss pile is probably going to just make that plant mold away really, really quickly. So just because it's a climber doesn't necessarily mean that it needs a moss pile. This one really just wants space. It grows super fast, but the purpose of the trellis is not to extend the root system. It's really just giving it a vertical support. All of the root system is just within the pot, so let's keep it that way. There's absolutely no need for a moss pile on your Discoia discolor. And the same would go for like a Cissus discolor, for example, as well. The same would probably also even go for Hoyas, right? I don't have any Hoyas, but I think you can include Hoyas in this list as well. The Hoyas don't need uh, a moss pile, even though they can actually grow aerial roots from their vines and from their nodes, but I don't think it would really make your Hoya mature. I should actually try, should I try? Has anybody tried growing a Hoya on a moss pile? Surely somebody has. I like to speak from experience, I don't have any experience with Hoya, so um, take that with a grain of salt. But on the Discoria Discolor, as well as the Sissus Discolor, definitely no moss pole needed. All right, moving on over here. This is my Philodendron Martianum. It's actually been one of my very first plants. I have this plant for, I think, five years now. At some stage, I have actually decided to give this a moss pole and you can see some roots within the moss pole over here but you can actually see there's more roots outside of the moss pole than inside the moss pole. It's well known for its thick petioles. I think it's also referred to as fat boy. I really like it but it's not a really fast grower clearly. This is what it's done in five years and it's pretty tolerant to growing outdoors at least here in Sydney. So I actually have this growing outdoors and it just survived a full harsh winter outdoors and it still looks like this. Now because it grows outdoors, the moss pole dries out quite quickly and I've been really, really slack in actually staying on top of watering this moss pole. Um, it was hanging on my fence and I fully forgot about it for like a couple of months. Um, and when it rains, you know, the surface area of the moss pole is not actually that large for the rain to really soak the moss pole properly. While the idea was for the moss pole to be a vertical extension of the pot, so I don't have to give it a larger pot and it's easier for me to hang it somewhere, I'm actually doing a terrible job at keeping the moss pole moist and hence I think there isn't all too much root growth within the moss pole. So now I'm faced with this predicament where like, well, do I just not do anything to the moss pile, but I need to somehow water it, otherwise it will never be a vertical extension of the pot. But then the plant is getting root bound and has all of these roots over here. So basically what I think I'm actually going to do to make my life easier is with the next repot, which is happening soon, I will dismantle this moss pile, I'll try and free up as many of these roots as I can and then I'll pot these roots back into the pot. This plant has really only climbed this much in five years, so it's not gonna really need the pole for the vertical support. It can easily just grow in the pot. Or I could actually put just a piece of bark on here. I think actually that's what I do. I think I'll put a piece of bark in the pot instead so the plant can somehow grow a little bit vertically 
like the display uh, aspect of it um, and I like that all of the leaves are on one side right you'll see that the moss pole is really facing all of the leaves to go one way rather than 360 that would take up too much space so I like the aesthetic purpose that the moss pole fulfills over here but I'm not really planning on using it as a vertical extension of the pod hence not really a good decision to give it a moss pile right might as well just give it a piece of wood so i think that's what i'm going to do and that's what i would recommend you guys do as well like the effort required to make and maintain the moss pile is never going to be rewarded by this plant you could get the same reward by just not giving it a moss pile as well so why wouldn't you do that righty next up we've got my thematophyllum i've got two actually and one of them is way too large to bring inside but we're going to talk about both of them now so i've got thermatophyllum xanadu over here and outside i've got a big thermatophyllum by that one thermatophyllums is a fairly newly described genus i believe and they used to also be referred to as tree philodendron. If you hear tree in philodendron, you think, oh yeah, let's give it a moss pile. But absolutely not. And the reason is very similar to the Deliciosa reason. I hope you can see this here. So you can see how slowly this plant really climbs. Very short internodal spacing. And as it climbs, it almost builds a little trunk. And that tree trunk is why they used to be referred to as tree philodendron. Um, I believe. The internal spacing here is so small I wouldn't really even be able to take a single node cutting of a plant like this. Huh? But it still sends out nice aerial roots but I'm just redirecting these aerial roots into the pot so they can extend and become proper water roots. So basically this plant does not need a vertical support because it's its own vertical support. It grows like a tree. This plant does not need a vertical extension of the pot to facilitate root growth of every single node because every single node is throwing out a thick chunky root into the substrate anyways. Every single node can absorb water and nutrients just from the pot. It doesn't need a pole. But I'm getting way too passionate about this, don't I? <laughs> Alright, next one isn't necessarily just one specific species, but I rather want to group a few together. And those are crawling philodendrons, specifically Philodendron plowmanii, Philodendron gloriosum, Philodendron pastazanum, Philodendron dean mcdowell. I think there's a Colombian species that's also a crawler. Now, I have actually seen people successfully grow crawling plants on moss poles but it's not necessarily something that I would recommend doing. Crawling philodendron are also called terrestrial philodendron because they grow terrestrially. Is that a word? I don't know, it is now. They crawl along the forest floor. That's how they naturally want to grow. So why would I want to force a plant to grow against its natural growth pattern if I also want to optimize it, right? If we're working with nature, we'll always have a better time looking after the plant because it's easy on us and it's easy on the plant so we'll most likely have success not like i haven't tried <laughs> you know i actually have tried and i have tried growing a my plowmanii on the moss pole i put it on the moss pole had like one really long internodal spacing thing um, i pinned it on the moss pole and then from there it just grew horizontally off the moss pole it does not want to grow vertically. It wants to grow horizontally. So I would really need to manage every single node and force the plant. Let's also quickly mention Philodendron gloriosum. If I would get a dollar every time somebody leaves a comment getting Philodendron glorious and gloriosum confused, I would never have to record a YouTube video ever again. <laughs> but uh, all jokes aside, I get it. It's very confusing and I actually made this mistake myself. I had a gloriosum. I saw Craig Miller Randall have a glorious on Instagram growing up a moss pole so I gave my gloriosum a moss pole and then the internet informed me that I did the wrong thing. Gloriosum is a crawling plant. Glorious is a hybrid of gloriosum and melanochrysum because melanochrysum is a climber. Glorious is also a climber. They shouldn't have named them uh, in such a similar way but yeah, you will not have success growing a gloriosum upper moss pole, but you can have success growing a glorious upper moss pole. You could potentially have success, but I don't think it's worth the effort. And I don't understand why. Like, why would we so desperately trying to force it? Um, so that's the next 
category of plants on my list basically, crawling philodendron. Let's stick to the name and let them crawl. Next up, this is my Monstera Peru and it's seen better days and yeah, I don't really care about this plant all too much. To be really honest, it's also a little bit sun stressed, but it represents a plant that doesn't really mature nicely um, or doesn't really mature, at least not that I've ever seen it. I doubt it would be possible in an indoor environment. Very similar to the Skindepsis actually. I prefer this as a trailing plant. It's not the nicest trailing plant in my opinion. I prefer the Skindepsis. It also likes lower light actually. So very similar reasons to the Skindepsis. I initially bought this however to grow it up a moss pole and I really wanted this to mature and see what a mature leaf looks like and didn't work for me and I didn't really see anybody online having success with it either. So yes, while it can climb, and you can see it wants to climb over here, for example. So yes, while it can climb, I don't think making and maintaining a moss pole is worth the effort if the plant isn't really changing as a result of it. Again, the whole purpose of the moss pole is to either propagate a plant or to help it to get to maturity without any setbacks. If it doesn't even get to maturity, then we don't need to minimize setbacks. You know what I mean? So yeah. And last on the list are anthuriums at large. Now, I actually have one anthurium on a moss pole, which is my queen. I had her on a moss pole and now I have her on a pole filled with airward mix. And both times she's really happy. But she actually grew up one full grow vertical pole in I think two and a half years. Now with maturity, she's climbing a little bit slower, but initially she was actually climbing pretty fast. So it made sense to give my queen a pole so that she can actually grow up it, like give it the vertical support. She absolutely shot the lights out when it comes to rooting into that pole. I'll insert a photo somewhere where you can see how many roots were within the pole. That's the definition of vertical extension of the pot. And the pole actually helped me make all of the leaves face one way. So I have a beautiful display side. So 10 out of 10 would recommend a moss pole for a queen. And there's a few others. I'm not the best with all of the anthurium names and there's so many hybrids and so on. So I can't give you a definitive list, but if you just look at the plant and or you Google a mature form of it, you'll be able to see how fast it climbs. Now, not all anthuriums actually climb. There are some crawling philodendron as well. Radicans would come to mind. Mavitarifolium, for example, also just kind of crawls towards the edge of the pot and then throws out these long leaves, right? So I don't think that would really climb. Most anthuriums actually climb. They just climb really, really slowly. Let me show you this. This plant over here, um, you can see these super chunky roots, right? So each, and I'm trying to get rid of a little bit of moss. You can see some chunky roots down here before. So you can see that the stem is climbing, right? The plant is climbing, like the stem is going up, it's not going horizontal. It is going up. However, this is climbing so slowly with such small internodal spacing that I rather just put a moss pile on here rather than a moss pole. And that moss pile can then take these roots that come out of the node and funnel them back into the pot. This makes it much easier for me, less uh, less work doing all the poles. Um, similar work when it comes to maintaining it. I do keep the top of this uh, moss moist at all times so that the roots don't dry out. The only thing that I feel like would be good about a pole with anthuriums is that anthuriums have the tendency to throw out leaves in all sorts of directions. So if you would put a pole here, it would basically stop any of the leaves going backwards and would push all leaves going forward. But I try and do that via light instead. So having a consistent light source coming from the font, giving me these um, um, display sites. But overall, apart from the queen, the queen is really the only one I could think of. Watermaliense, that one? I don't know, sorry, I'm so, I'm really terrible with anthurium names. But yeah, the Crystallinums, the Forgettiis, the Magnificums, um, I personally would not give it a moss pole. It's just not really needed for these plants because they climb so slowly. And quite obviously you saw there were heaps of root growth over here, so we don't need the pole to optimize the root growth. The roots are growing prolifically. I'll park that on the side and I'll wrap up the video. Those are 10 plants or family of plants that I believe don't need a moss pole. Now, if you have a Deliciosa and you're giving it a moss pole, 
don't panic, you know, if you have a tie and you're giving it a moss pole, don't panic. Just because I don't want to give it a moss pole doesn't mean that it's not possible. And maybe you don't have the same goals as me, right? Maybe you grow it up a moss pole for propagation purposes because you're planning on chopping that into single note cuttings and passing it on to friends. Whereas I'm planning on growing a plant to maturity and so on, right? So we might have different goals in mind and with different goals come different approaches. However, if you've put a non-climbing plant on a moss pole, then I would encourage you to just change it. Um, it or at least stop watering the moss pole. You don't need to maintain that moss pole with the next repot, maybe take the pole out of that pot of alocasias. Anyway, that is it. <laughs> I get so passionate about these videos. I just keep talking, talking and talking. So hopefully uh, it wasn't too much yapping and hopefully my passion came through and uh, hopefully you learned something from this video as well. Let me know in the comments down below what plants you have decided to not give a moss pole to and also let me know how it's going. Thank you so much for watching, like, subscribe and leave a nice comment and I'll see you next time. Bye!